In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please have a seat. Um, you may have noticed that each year we come to Easter and we use a different gospel on a three-year cycle. And this year, it is the gospel of Mark. And Mark, of all the gospels, has the briefest and sparsest uh, resurrection narrative. And it ends in a very dramatic way. Nobody ever meets Jesus in Mark. Uh, the women don't tell anybody in Mark. It just kind of ends. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So there's lots of scholarly debate whether this is a true ending or not, and folk have added bits on to make it a bit neater and so on. Um, I don't know. One of the many questions I want to ask all sorts of people long into the future. But it works for me. I think for us in the 21st century, in a postmodern context in many ways, of which there are many uncertainties, the Gospel of Mark's ending works. Um, all the way through Mark, one of Mark's themes is that people find faith difficult. People find belief in Jesus hard. I mean, you know, if I you just even just last night or early this morning, you know, we're saying, Man, Paul, they found it hard enough to believe when Jesus was actually there. No, more, no wonder you've got a hard job even now, 2,000 plus years later, you know. Um, and, and, and Mark actually, there's three or four places in the Gospel of Mark where he has a similar response. Jesus does something dramatic, like steadying the storm in the middle of Galilee, or I think maybe heal, healing or raising Jairus' daughter. And, the, and you have a very similar wording here. Amazement had Fear and amazement seized them. They didn't understand what was happening. And it's interesting, one of the other themes of Mark is that Jesus really wanted to keep his, who he was a secret from people. He didn't want people to know that he was the Messiah they had all been waiting for. And the reason partly was because um, if word had got out and was spreading that he was the Messiah, it's one of these really, really loaded words, right, that folk put all their hopes and agendas on. So there were as many different beliefs and hopes in a Messiah at that time in Israel as there was beliefs and hopes in political salvation today. We, different people have different hopes of what the prime minister will or will not do, for example. And we see this even within a younger generation today in which there is more and more of a disillusionment with our democratic process. There is actually a hankering within people for a strong leader who will sort things, who will fix things, and they will put into that box all of their hopes and aspirations. And Jesus really did, he was pushing back against that. Because he, what he wanted was is that people would not believe in him until he had risen from the dead. He wanted to, he wanted, because none of them, none of those current understandings of what it meant to be a Messiah, none of those stories or those hopes involved him going to the cross. It just wasn't in any of them. Nobody expected the Messiah to go to the cross. That was just not on the agenda. And he would have had approval ratings of minus 100 if he said the Messiah is going to suffer and to die. And he did tell them that, but they couldn't hear it. And this capture, the public capture of what the Messiah was was why Jesus wanted to keep it secret. So he kept it now until once the resurrection happened, then that vindicated what the cross had been and what had happened. And so for Jesus, for Jesus, for Mark's narrative, faith was something that came after a long struggle and many disappointments and disillusionments and lots of not understanding. Faith was something that came out of the blue when you were, when you were confronted with something that just did not make any sense. Now, I don't know if the post-resurrection Jesus could be tempted. It's a big theological question. It came to me just about half past nine this morning. Right, as I was sitting having a coffee back home. I'm not sure. But if I was post-resurrection Jesus, I would have been tempted to have gone into the temple 
and appeared to everybody and said, Tara, here I am. It's me, I'm back. And I was right and you were all wrong. I would have totally done that. And that's just me being me, you know? Because he would have just, it would have just blown everybody away. All the suffering, all the hassle, all the sniping, all the criticism, all the misunderstanding that he had gone through. It would have been totally vindicated in public. He would have blown them out of the water, literally. But he doesn't do that. And in Mark's version, he does it so low key that you almost miss it. And I'm not, I'm, I don't want to kind of repeat stuff I said in previous years, because we all know that one of the great, great, one of the many great signs of the authenticity of these four narratives is the fact that they choose women as the first witnesses. It's, it's such a sexist, ah, I've been mean, saying that, it seems so wrong today, so un PC and sexist. But it was just a fact. In those days, the women's testimony was just not seen as valid. And yet, this is the people who Jesus appears to, first of all. And how does he do it? Because they were not expecting a resurrection. This is another sign. This is authentic narrative. None of them were expecting Jesus to be resurrected. They weren't. And, and they're on their way there. And, you know, these women just want to be with him. There was nothing in it for them anymore. He'd gone. There was nothing in it for being with them anymore. For being with him. They just wanted to go and be there and perhaps put some spices on his body because people's bodies decay fast in that heat. But they're not even thinking straight because there's this massive stone. Basically, it's put in a groove. But there was a real problem in those days of grave robbers but also, get this, of second-hand graves, upcycling, all right, okay? In which people nick somebody else's grave and put their body in it. Obviously, different cultures and generations have different temptations and challenges. That's not a problem today. It was a problem then. So you really wanted to secure your gravestone. So you had a groove into the ground, probably laced with stone, and a huge circle of stone had been rolled down into it. So very, very difficult to move. You'd have had to lift it out of the groove, or you'd have had to push it back up the slope again. Which, you know, even Elliot couldn't manage that on his own. You know, it's a tough, tough thing to do. And the women are, the women are on, and they're, like, they're still thinking, oh, who's, who's going to move the stone? You know? And there was something about that question which for me summarizes the human predicament, the human condition. That there is, we know we should be doing something, but we can't quite do it. There's a gap between our hopes and aspiration and actually delivering it. Whether it's politically, whether it's socially, whether it's environmentally, whether it's spiritually, whether it's just trying to fix stuff in our own lives or our own families. There is always a, there is always a, oh, who's gonna, who's gonna sort this? Who's gonna do this? And, and, and for me, as, as a people, as someone, I've been in ministry for so many decades now, I see so much sadness and people's hopes and dashed and all sorts of things. There is this, I mean, in Isaiah, you get this beautiful figurative picture in Isaiah's reading from many centuries before. We talked about death as a sheet that is spread over all the nations, or the old-fashioned version is a shroud over all the nations. And we have a, a book at the back of our church of those who have died, and we just lost Sadie Ellis just over a week ago. Death is something which comes to everybody, and we can't fix it. We lose our loved ones. Or, or you take a step back, I just Facebook friend just this morning popped up as every Saturday they have protested in Inverness since the beginning of October against all, well, just all the hostility and fighting in Gaza. My pal is a consultant up at the Rigmore, and he's been to Gaza to train doctors over there. And, and his wife just put down, the season's turning, it's so warm now but it makes us realize just how many months we have been gathering here every Saturday. 
about the violence and the suffering on all sides. Yeah. The shroud that covers the earth, that shroud is still there. Remember that wonderful photo from the astronauts of the earth called Moonrise or whatever it is? But it's a lovely picture. So we can see the earth for the first time from space. And to think of a shroud over that, death, suffering, not just a bit death, but it's suffering and the way that we mess things up and the way that we'll always face the thing, oh, who will move the stone for us? Who will move the stone for us? And the women go and they find the stone rolled away. And the stone's rolled away not so that Jesus can get out, okay? It's just so that they can look in. It's just so that they can look in and see that he's gone. And there's, and there's a young man there, and, and, and uh, Mark doesn't use the word for the angel, he uses the word for a young man. Again, very low key. He's not a dazzling angel in Mark's version. He's, I mean, Mark's trying to make it difficult to believe in this. He's making it so low key, it's almost under the radar. But I think for so many of us today, life is like that. Faith doesn't come in multicolored technicolors. I've got two daughters, right? One of them decorates her house with every possible color under the sun. The other one only uses different shades of gray. All right, two kids from the same family. I just don't work it out, you know? But for most of us, faith is not multicolored. It's lots and lots of shades of gray. And it's learning how to read between them. And Mark's gospel is great for people who live with shades of gray, the subtleties. But you see, Mark is drawing us into the story. Mark is drawing us into the story. In fact, he's asking us a question a little bit like this this morning. For us, in our own personal situation, our own personal... Uh, why is my phone not switching on here? This place. He's, he's asking us, name the things that break your heart, the things that you don't understand, the places in which God seems distant, absent, or even dead. He's asking us, do you believe in this risen Savior? Do you have hope in the grayness of your life and the different things that are there? To name the things that break your heart, the things that you don't understand, the places in which God seems distant, absent, or even dead. I find that a challenge for my own life, but also for my family, and also for the wider world that we live in. And Easter comes around every year, and it challenges us to hope again. And what does it involve? Well, you see, in Mark's version, the disciples are told to go to Galilee to meet Jesus there. And as you know, as I've said here often, Galilee is basically between here and Fort William, okay, from Jerusalem. So you're talking about a four or five day journey. And, and, and the disciples, honestly, if I was them, it'd be 50-50 whether, whether I would go. I'd be thinking, look, I am not going to be hurt again. I'm not going to be disappointed again. I'm not going to make all the hassle to go up there just for a story. Uh-uh. Not going to fall for that. Faith is hard. And part of what Mark is doing here, he's drawing us into the story and he's saying, will you make that journey? Will you? It's this kind of open ending. The women were amazed and afraid. What's your reaction going to be? And I think there's something about the Christian, and I've said it in my blog, which is in the back of the magazine, which you get magazine at the end when you go, but I, will, I might email the blog out to you. Just, it's all about the up in the sky, they've got what's called the lambing snow. It's the snow that comes in late spring, uh, late winter, early spring, when the lambs are out, it catches some of them, you know? And the farmers have got to watch out for that, the lambing snow. And, and our hopes, because the thing is, Easter comes after a long period of darkness. Spring comes after a long period of darkness. And for some of us, we've had a long period of discouragement and disappointment and hurt in our lives, and it's not been much light. And it's really hard to hope for after a period of that. It's really hard to hope for things in Gaza to get fixed. I mean, I stand to you saying these wonderful promises that Jesus is risen, so all's going to be fine. 
I don't actually know what that actually means in real political terms. I don't. But there's something about the Christian gospel of the Easter which says, even after a long period of darkness, and, and we're beginning to hope again, we're beginning to hope again, but suddenly the cold winds of disappointment can blow in, or the, or the cold winds of criticism, or the cold winds of doubt, or, or the cold winds of fear and anxiety. We're just beginning to hope, and the cold winds can come and can freeze our hope before it gets going to be daffodils through the snow. And Easter encourages us to hang in there because the seasons are turning. The snow is melting. Darkness is gone. The light is lit. So whatever you are today in your life, in the challenges and the joys of being in this beautiful spring day here in Bishop Briggs, to know that God, Easter says God will walk with you into the uncertainties that lie ahead. And that like the woman and this subtle, inconclusive ending of Mark's gospel, maybe it does resonate with where you're at. It's not all black and white, multicolored, crystal clear, but it does challenge us, can we walk in faith? Because faith is the final part. Faith is the key that interprets our circumstances. That's the, I was really, really hit me preparing for this sermon more than any other time, to interpret what is going on around us and to really see hope in it actually requires faith. It's like faith is a pair of specs that you put on and you suddenly see things that you don't see otherwise. And I don't mean that in a simplistic, blasé way, but the, the, the choice to believe, if we, all it's, it is a choice. The choice to believe, to go to Galilee, the choice to go to the tomb and lay the spices, even though there's no, I'm not sure who's going to roll back this door. And that choice, that act of faith, it's like a key which unlocks the door. It's like a pair of specs, to, just a new way of seeing to help you to see how things really are. And I honestly believe without that faith, it is difficult, really difficult over the long term to hope. And that is the Christian Christmas, uh, Easter story. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I mean, it could be quiet just for a minute or two. And just leaves you with that question again. <laughs> Name the things that break your heart, the things you don't understand, the places in which God seems distant, absent, or even dead. Can you hope for these things?